Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Michael Brown. Yes, my legal name is Michael. And across the table from me, as usual, is Matthew Stockton. Oh, you almost said across the stage from me, didn't you? Across the stage. <laughs> yeah, my, my old acting days. Across the stage. From across. Me. <laughs> camera right <laughs> is, is Matthew. Ma Matthew Stockton. <laughs> oh, anyway, how are you today? I'm good. Uh, this is going to be kind of a difficult and personal episode for me. Yeah, we want to do this in a little different way. It's going to be a, a little more solemn, so I'll read. Because it's our Remembrance Day episode, mm. I will tell the story. And then at one point, Matthew tells the story of his grandfather's involvement in the events of this episode. Yes. Yeah, so let's get to it. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Eighty years ago, on August 19, 1942, Operation Jubilee began as the Allies attacked the German-occupied French port of Dieppe. Of the more than 6,100 troops involved in the raid, 5,000 of them were soldiers of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, and 1,000 were British, many commandos, with a handful of others including Americans. The hope was to test the strength of Hitler's heavily fortified Atlantic Wall. But unfortunately, the Germans were ready for the Allied force and things did not go as planned. After nine excruciating hours of brutal fighting along the shore, the Allied force retreated. Almost 1,000 Allied troops lay dead and at least 2,000 more were prisoners of war, making this one of Canada's darkest days ever in a time of war. You are listening to Dark Poutine, Episode 243, Remembrance Day 2022, Disaster at Dieppe. As Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party went through the process of seizing power in Germany, there were plenty of red flags. It was clear to many that Hitler had designs on broader things, starting with Europe and then on to the rest of the world. After Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939, Britain and France declared war on Germany. Then, standing by its allies, Canada declared war on Germany September 10, 1939. The conflict soon expanded into the Second World War, the deadliest war the world has ever seen, to this point. By 1942, Hitler's Nazi Germany had established dominance in Western Europe, made gains in North Africa, and pushed into Russia. German U-boats patrolled the Atlantic, making that ocean a dangerous and deadly place for still free allies to ship goods to the British Isles, the last Allied holdout in Western Europe. The Allies were, according to experts, losing the war. They had to do something. 
Hitler had endeavored to create fortress Europe along the Atlantic coast by fortifying every inch of German-occupied coastline with concrete and steel defenses, bunkers filled with hardened troops and bristling with armaments, heavy machine guns, and artillery, all in the hope of repelling any Allied attack from the sea. From warmuseum.ca, quote, The main portion of the Atlantic Wall stretched some 2,000 kilometers from Denmark to the Spanish-French border. German military engineers built observation bunkers at wide intervals all along the coast. Lookouts in these bunkers could give a warning of an Allied attack and direct naval, air, and mobile land forces to the scene. Some 15,000 bunkers and other installations protected harbors and points along the shore where there were important facilities and likely landing spots. Barbed wire, minefields, and other obstacles provided the first line of defense against Allied infantry and tanks. Small bunkers containing machine guns or light artillery covered these positions and protected the long-range artillery batteries behind them. These batteries received a two-meter-thick protection of steel-reinforced concrete to protect them against Allied naval and air bombardment. Hitler personally sketched many of the bunker designs down to the smallest detail. From 1942, the Toad Organization, a labor mobilization system notorious for its use of forced and slave labor, built most of the bunkers, but thousands of German troops also toiled to prepare the Atlantic Wall defenses. End quote. The Germans suspected that any attack had to come from England, only some 40 kilometers across the English Channel. So it was here that Germans had built up their heaviest fortifications, including their most deadly artillery. Hitler and his advisors were right. The Allies were desperate to get into Europe and force Hitler into a two-front war which they hoped would quickly deplete German resources and their will to continue to fight. Planning for Operation Overlord, the name of the D-Day operation, was already in the works, but the Allies knew they didn't yet have the resources or experience for that massive undertaking, so Overlord would have to wait. The Allies chose to mount a major raid on just the French port of Dieppe. They designed the raid to gain experience and test the equipment needed to launch an immense amphibious assault that would one day be necessary to defeat Germany. And after years of training in Britain, some Canadian politicians and generals were anxious for Canadian troops to experience battle. An article in Legion magazine referred to the raid as, quote, a reconnaissance in force. From the Dieppe Raid Fact Sheet on the Government of Canada's Veterans Affairs website, quote, Why Raid Dieppe? Many factors contributed to the decision to mount a large raid into occupied Europe in 1942. The Soviet Union was pressuring the Allied forces to open a second front in Western Europe. The Allies, however, needed more time to build up their military resources before undertaking such a massive effort. They felt that a large raid on the east coast of France, however, would force the Germans to divert more of their military resources away from the Soviet Union and also help in the planning for the full-scale Allied assault that would eventually have to take place. Canadian soldiers had been training since the outset of the war and, except for the Battle of Hong Kong, had yet to see significant action. There was political pressure at home to finally get the Canadians into battle, as well as impatience within the army itself. Dieppe is a resort town situated at a break in the cliffs along the northwest coast of France and was selected as the main target of the raid partially because it was within range of fighter planes from Britain. The Allies' plan was to launch a large-scale amphibious landing, damage enemy shipping and port facilities, and gather intelligence on German defenses and radar technology. Recent research has suggested that the desire to capture a top-secret Enigma code machine and accompanying code books was also an important factor in mounting the raid. End quote. It was the British who headed the planning for Operation Jubilee. However, when Canadian Lieutenant General Harry D.G. Carrar got wind of the operation, he demanded that the raid should use a predominantly Canadian contingent of soldiers. In late June of 1942, a written report from Montgomery, the head of Allied operations, expressed his confidence that the operation would succeed. He included a P.S. Quote, the Canadians are first-class chaps. If anyone can pull it off, they will. End quote. Although some questioned the wisdom of a full frontal assault on a fortified position, the British and Canadian strategists were in agreement with the military doctrines that prevailed at the time, and they felt that success was likely. From Legion Magazine, quote, 
Carrar was acting commander of the Canadian Corps while General A.G.L. McNaughton was in Canada on sick leave. He had been chief of the general staff in Ottawa until recently and believed it vital for public opinion at home that Canadian troops, some in England for almost three years, get into action before the Yanks in the war only since December 7, 1941. Moreover, the Canadian troops wanted action, fed up with hearing the refrain, oh, he's Canadian, he doesn't fight, from their girlfriends and British Tommies. Reluctantly, perhaps, the British conceded that Canadians could take on Dieppe, and Montgomery picked 2nd Canadian Infantry Division and 1st Canadian Armoured Brigade for the operation, the second being, in his judgment as the British Army's preeminent trainer, the best trained and best led in the Canadian Corps, end quote. At the end of spring, the Canadian troops began training hard for the raid, set to take place on July 7, 1942. However, when the day came, even after boarding the troop ships for the trip across the channel, bad weather and German Luftwaffe attacks on the ports forced the postponement of the raid. Up to that point, the everyday troops had no idea where they were headed. They'd been told once they were aboard the boats, though. But after being stood down, the soldiers had to return to their barracks and homes to which they were billeted. There is no way that all of them kept quiet, and it's presumed that information about the target of the raid, the coastal town of Dieppe, got back to the Germans who redoubled their fortification efforts there. The Germans were on full alert, expecting a raid any day that summer. On the evening of August 18, 1942, the troops were once again loaded onto ships to head to Dieppe. The fleet consisted of 237 ships and landing barges, including six destroyers. The incursion force included 4,963 men and officers from the 2nd Canadian Division, 1,005 British commandos, 50 U.S. Rangers, and 15 Frenchmen. Royal Air Force and Royal Canadian Air Force bombers and fighters would give support from the air. Things went sideways just before the convoy reached the French coast. The Allied group ran into a German convoy bound for Dieppe that had sailed from Boulogne at 8 p.m. on August 18th. The German convoy was tiny in comparison to the Allied group, only five motor vessels protected by a minesweeper and two U-boats. It was, however, large enough to throw a spanner into the works. At 3.47 a.m., Group 5, the most easterly group in the Allied force, ran into the enemy convoy, and the battle began. According to the book, six years later, published by the Canadian Department of National Defense, quote, Group 5 consisted of some 23 personnel landing craft carrying No. 3 Commando, whose task it was to assault the Berneville Battery. They were escorted by a steam gunboat, a motor launch, and a flak landing craft. In the violent little naval encounter which now took place, the British escort vessels were seriously damaged. One of the German submarine chasers, number 1404, became a total loss. But more important, the craft carrying number three commando were completely scattered, some of them being damaged. End quote. The landings began at 4.50 a.m. at four initial entry points, Yellow Beach, Orange Beach, Blue Beach, and Green Beach, all the way from Dieppe. The main attack at Dieppe itself would take place on red and white beaches. It was Yellow Beach, where Lieutenant Colonel John Dunford Slater and No. 3 Commando were to conduct two landings 13 kilometers east of Dieppe to silence the coastal battery Goebbels near Berneval. However, thanks to the battle at sea, the Berneval attack had been disrupted, and only seven of the landing craft landed their troops. Not only were troops not able to take a major objective, the element of surprise was lost. By the time the landing crafts were headed into the beach for their final push, they were already under withering fire from the German positions. The commandos from six craft who did land on Yellow One were beaten back, unable to safely retreat or join the main force, and had to surrender. Only 18 commandos got ashore on Yellow Two Beach. They reached the perimeter of the battery via Berneval after it was attacked by hurricane fighter bombers engaging their target with small arms fire. Orange Beach, was around 10 kilometers west of Dieppe. The orders for Lieutenant Colonel Lord Lovett and No. 4 Commando, including the 50 United States Army Rangers, were to take out the coastal battery Hess at blanc maisnil saint marie marguerite near Verangeville. This would be touted as the only real success of the day. From Six Years of War, quote, 
The plan was for one party, 88 strong and commanded by Major D. Mills Roberts, to land at Vasterival and engage the battery in front with mortar fire, while the main body under Lord Lovett landed at Orange II, made a detour, and attacked it from the rear. This plan was carried out exactly as written. Major Mills Roberts' party had reached the cliff top successfully, advanced upon the battery and fired on it with small arms and a two-inch mortar. At or about 6.07 a.m., charges stacked beside the German guns, ready for use, blew up. The commando attributes the explosion to a bomb from the mortar, but German accounts blame fire from low-flying aircraft. The battery never fired again. It was kept under fire until 6.20 a.m., when, in accordance with the plan, RAF cannon fighters made a low-level attack upon it. Simultaneously, Lovett's main party, having landed and moved inland, successfully attacked it with bayonet. After a short, fierce fight, the positions were cleared and the garrison cut to pieces. Captain P.A. Porteous particularly distinguished himself. Although painfully wounded, he took command of a troop which had lost its officers and led it in the final rush across the open ground, swept by machine gun fire. Again wounded, he continued to lead his men until the battery was taken. He was awarded the Victoria Cross. Lord Lovett's force suffered about 45 casualties, including two officers and 10 other ranks killed. But this loss purchased full success. The menace of the battery to our shipping off Dieppe was wholly removed, for its guns were blown up before the commando withdrew, according to the plan, at about 7.30 a.m. Number four commando's action is a model of boldness and effective synchronization. At 8.50 a.m., Lord Lovett reported to the headquarters ship and the chief of combined operations. The signal to the latter ran, quote, Every one of the gun crews finished with bayonet. Okay by you? Actually, not quite the whole of the German unit had been liquidated, but it had suffered very heavily. Its strength is variously stated from 93 to 112 men. Its losses, which vary only slightly in different German accounts, were about 30 killed and 30 wounded, a portion of which reflects the use of the bayonet. Four prisoners were taken back to England. End quote. The Royal Regiment of Canada had attached to it three platoons of the Black Watch, Royal Highland Regiment of Canada and detachments of the 3rd Light Anti-Aircraft Regiment and the 4th Field Regiment, RCA. The artillerymen were to assist in capturing enemy guns in the area and subsequently to man them. The plan for the crucial Blue Beach portion of the raid at Pease was that, quote, the Royal Regiment of Canada at Blue Beach will secure the headland east of Jubilee, Dieppe, and destroy local objectives consisting of machine gun posts, heavy and light flak installations, and a four-gun battery south and east of the town. The battalion will then come into reserve and detach a company to protect an engineer demolition party operating in the gas works and power plant, end quote. It's not an easy thing to organize hundreds of troops, get them safely into landing craft, and into rough seas in the dark. Disembarkation from the ships took longer than expected and the sea battle involving number 3 commando had made its way near this beach, which had further alerted the Germans to the impending attack. As many of the landing craft were late, the German defenders here had more time to prepare and were ready for the Allies. The landing craft were 20 minutes later than they'd planned to be, and the smoke screens laid out on time that should have hidden their assault had already blown away by the time those craft arrived. As far as 100 meters offshore, the landing craft were under accurate fire from the shore batteries. Major G.P. Schofield, the senior officer of the Royals with the first wave, was slightly wounded before the landing. All accounts agree, moreover, that as this wave touched down and the craft dropped their ramps, machine gun fire was greatly intensified and heavy casualties were suffered immediately. From veterans.gc.ca, quote, only a few men were able to get over the heavily wired seawall at the head of the beach. Those who did were unable to get back. The rest of the troops, together with three platoons of reinforcements from the Black Watch Royal Highland Regiment of Canada, were pinned on the beach by mortar and machine gun fire and were later forced to surrender. It was impossible to evacuate them because of German fire. Of those who landed on the eastern flank, 200 were killed and 20 died later of their wounds. The rest were taken prisoner. It was the heaviest toll suffered by a Canadian battalion in a single day during the entire war. Also, the failure to clear the eastern headland allowed the Germans to defend Dieppe beaches with firepower from both sides, 
and nullify the main frontal attack, end quote. What happened at Pease was the worst of the whole undertaking. The Royal Regiment had more men killed than any other unit involved in the raid. The regiment's fatalities amounted to 227 out of the 554 who'd embarked. Experts have stated that the failure at Pease was the key in the failure of the raid as a whole. The naval force commander stated, quote, There is little doubt that this was the chief cause of failure of the military plan. End quote. More after a quick break. When we come back, we'll hear about the rest of the operation and its aftermath, as well as Matthew's story about his grandfather, who was at Dieppe that day. And we are back, Matthew. This is such an involved operation, and it seemed to be doomed from the outset. And everything went sideways. Yeah. Um, with thousands of people. With thousands of people right? involved, yeah. And you look back, it, it's war, right? Yeah. Like, people can go, oh, you know, you know, start pointing fingers, but it's war, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and this was way before the amount of intelligence I think that people get these days in war. Yeah. So, um, you know, nothing can be changed because this is such a part of our history. And our, I think a lot of Canadians know about the Battle of Dieppe. Yeah. Right? And um, we, a lot of people, maybe, I mean, you're telling me some stuff that I didn't know because I didn't dive into it this deeply other than sort of on, on a personal level. Mm -hmm. When we look back, you know, you see it was doomed from the beginning. Yeah. 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 At 4.42 a.m., almost simultaneous to the landing at Orange Beach, came the Green Beach Landing. The 1st Battalion of the South Saskatchewan Regiment were tasked with heading toward Poorville and taking the German radar station there. They landed undetected some distance west of their objective, having drifted off course in the dark. Although there was no initial resistance, the Germans were soon aware that they were there and blocked the only bridge into Poorville with anti-tank guns. From junobeach.org, quote, Before the Canadians had a chance to reach that bridge, the Germans were in position, blocking their progression with a wall of machine gun and anti-tank artillery fire. Dead and wounded soldiers piled up on the bridge. Lieutenant Colonel Merritt, commanding officer of the South Saskatchewan, stepped forward, bareheaded, his helmet in his hand, and shouted to his men, Come on over, there's nothing to it. The assault resumed, but nothing could be done. The South Saskatchewans and the Cameron Highlanders of Canada who joined them soon were unable to reach their target. Close by, other troops from the Cameron, under Major A.T. Law, moved inland toward Petite Abbeville. Cut off from their battalion, they were forced to retreat and be evacuated. Merritt's courage allowed most of the South Saskatchewans and Camerons to be evacuated, but a small rear guard detached to hold the Germans back did not make it. Merritt was awarded the Victoria Cross. End quote. According to historian Ronald Atkins' book, Dieppe 1942, The Jubilee Disaster, an RAF flight sergeant named Jack Nissenthal, a radar specialist, was a key player in the plan to take out the radar installation at Poorville. He had volunteered for the mission, knowing there might be a terrible price to pay, but not only at the hands of the Germans. Eleven members of the South Saskatchewan Regiment were tasked as bodyguards, not only to get Nissenthal safely to the radar station, but to shoot him if it appeared that he was going to be taken prisoner. Jack was aware of the situation and still volunteered. He was provided a cyanide pill to take in case his bodyguards were killed and capture was imminent. Keeping secret the knowledge of Allied radar systems that Jack carried in his head, he agreed, was more important to the war effort than his own life. The raid on the radar station failed. Jack did manage to cut the foam wires leading into the station, hampering communication from within. According to James Lesser's book, Green Beach, the radar operators inside were forced to use unsecured radio frequencies to talk to their commanders. These communications were intercepted by listening posts on the south coast of England. As a result, allies were able to learn a great deal about the improved accuracy, location, capacity, and density of German radar stations along the Channel Coast, which helped to convince Allied commanders of the importance of developing radar jamming technology. Only Jack Nissenthal and one South Saskatchewan Regiment soldier in their party returned to England. From Six Years of War, quote, 
the frontal attack on Dieppe was to be delivered by the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry on the right and the Essex Scottish on the left, with the nine leading tanks of the 14th Army Tank Regiment landing simultaneously with the 1st Infantry. The assault was to be covered by the 4-inch guns of the destroyers, and close-support fighter aircraft were to attack the beaches, the buildings overlooking them, and gun positions on the West Headland, as the landing craft finally approach and the first troops step ashore on red and white beaches. There was no hope of surprise here, for the flank landings were scheduled for a half hour earlier, and we have seen that the alarm was given in Dieppe following the Pourville landing 20 minutes before the main assault. End quote. At 5.15 a.m., five RAF hurricane squadrons began dropping their ordnance on the coastal defenses and set the smokescreen for the incoming landing craft. Between 5.20 and 5.23, soldiers from the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry and the Essex Scottish Regiment landed on the beach and began their trudge through the obstacles and barbed wire toward the town. From junobeach.org, quote, Poor timing proved fateful. The tanks of the 14th Armored Regiment scheduled to arrive at the same time were late, and as a result, the two infantry regiments had to attack without artillery support. Landing crafts were hit or destroyed before or after the landing, making the retreat even more problematic. Whole platoons were annihilated as soon as they set foot on the beach. Hiding behind the partly demolished casino, groups from the RHLI and the Essex Scottish succeeded in sneaking into town and fought gallantly. They were, however, unable to neutralize the enemy and to reach their assigned targets. The Calgary Regiment tanks arrived soon after the infantry. 29 got off the landing craft, but two fell into deep water. Of the remaining 27, 15 made it across the seawall between the beach and the boardwalk, as it was not very high in places. Without engineers, they were unable to eliminate obstacles that blocked their way into the city and were forced to return to the beach, where one after the other they got hit or bellied in the beach shingle. Still able to fire, the 14th Regiment's tanks protected the infantry's retreat to the very end. The tank crews paid a heavy toll for their gallant behavior, as they were all made prisoners. At 9 a.m., the commanders of the raid had to face the evidence that they had failed. The Germans were still in control of the hills and were firing without mercy at the beaches. Orders were given to evacuate at 11 a.m. The landing craft sailed back towards the beaches under a smokescreen cover and partially protected by RAF fighters. Evacuation took place in utter confusion as fighting was still going on nearby. At 12.20, the beaches could no longer be reached, even if men were still there. HMS Kalp made a last attempt at 12.48 and headed for the shore with two boats. The fleet then sailed back to England. The Dieppe raid was over. Some 3,367 men, including 2,752 Canadians, remained on the beach, dead or soon to be made prisoners. End quote. Of the nearly 5,000 strong Canadian contingent, 3,367 were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner, an exceptional casualty rate of 68%. The 1,000 British commandos lost 247 men. Of the 50 U.S. Army Rangers serving in commando units, six were killed, seven wounded, and four captured. There had been 907 Canadians killed, along with 52 British. The Royal Navy lost the destroyer Berkeley and 33 landing craft, suffering 550 dead and wounded. The RAF lost 106 aircraft. RAF Sea Rescue Services picked up around 20 pilots out of the cold ocean. Among the RAF losses, six RAF aircraft had been shot down by gunners on their own side. One typhoon was shot down by a Spitfire and two others were lost when their tails broke off and two Spitfires collided during the withdrawal across the channel. It was a gong show. The Germans suffered 591 casualties, 322 fatal and 280 wounded, 48 aircraft and one patrol boat. One of the heroes of the day was Corporal Romold Nelez Tominsk, captain of the Polish destroyer Orp Slazak. During the raid on Dieppe, the captain lost four of his crew members, but the Slazak avenged her own by bringing down five enemy planes. For his role in rescuing 85 Canadians, mostly members of the Royal Regiment of Canada from the rolling waters off Dieppe, the captain was awarded Britain's Distinguished Service Cross. Amid all the carnage were many tales of bravery. One person, later awarded the Victoria Cross, was Major Patrick Anthony Porteous, we mentioned him earlier. Here's a more detailed version of his story. 
according to the London Gazette, on the 2nd of October, 1942. At Dieppe, on the 19th of August, Major Porteous was detailed to act as liaison officer between the two detachments whose task was to assault the heavy coast defense guns. In the initial assault, Major Porteous, working with the smaller of the two detachments, was shot at close range through the hand, the bullet passing through his palm and entering his upper arm. Undaunted, Major Porteous closed with his assailant, succeeding in disarming him, and killed him with his own bayonet, thereby saving the life of a British sergeant on whom the German had turned his aim. In the meantime, the larger detachment was held up, and the officer leading this detachment was killed, and the troop sergeant major fell seriously wounded. Almost immediately afterward, the only officer of the detachment was also killed. Major Porteous, without hesitation, and in the face of withering fire, dashed across the open ground to take over command of this detachment. Rallying them, he led them in a charge which carried the German position at the point of the bayonet and was severely wounded for the second time. Though shot through the thigh, he continued to the final objective where he eventually collapsed from blood loss after the last of the guns had been destroyed. Major Porteous's most gallant conduct, his brilliant leadership and tenacious devotion to a duty which was supplementary to the role originally assigned to him was an inspiration to the whole detachment. Patrick Porteous was invested with his Victoria Cross by King George VI at Buckingham Palace on the 27th of October, 1942, end quote. Canadians and the rest of the world heard about the raid as details of it were wired to radio and newspaper organizations. Over the next few days, lists of the missing were posted as they became available. Families with soldiers overseas poured over the names on the list looking for their loved ones and if on the list, prayed that their boys had been captured and were not wounded or dead. Survivors described their experiences to newspapers. From the Montreal Gazette on August 24, 1942, quote, The Battle of the Seawall was one of the grimmest of the entire operation. One of the clearest and most graphic descriptions of the battle was given by Private Eugene Cosineau of Windsor, Ontario, who joined the Essex Scottish when the regiment was mobilized at the start of the war. I was with A Company, commanded by Captain Dennis Guest, and in Platoon 9, said Cosineau, a tall, husky lad who proved he had all the courage in the world. There were explosions around the boats as we were going in, he said. We touched down and I was the fourth man out of the boat. We got to the barbed wire on the beach and cut our way through. Heavy fire was raking the landing craft. We made the seawall and had practically all our section with us. A pillbox up to the right was taken out by the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. We worked up the wall until we got opposite the tobacco factory. This was just about a hundred yards away over the promenade and at the corner of Verdun Boulevard and Rue Duquesne. From the tobacco factory and other buildings around it, we were getting artillery fire and machine gun stuff. The Essex opened fire right away from the seawall on the buildings along the opposite side of the promenade. The gang I was with stayed there fighting from the seawall from 6 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. We couldn't move from there, but we gave the Germans plenty to worry about even then. There was a castle on the cliff on the west headland, and its machine guns walloped us a lot. Besides, German aircraft strafed the beach on the way back from a bombing raid on the fleet lying offshore. The Fuzzies, soldiers nicknamed for the Les Fusiliers Mont-Royal, joined us behind the seawall, although they had come through hellish fire. Some of them got through into the town later. We stuck right there until the withdrawal order came through late in the morning. The morale of the Essex was high all the way. The officers were mighty grand. I remember particularly Lieutenant Jack Prince, Captain Guest, and Major John Willis, whom I saw with us in the fight. Mr. Prince was running up and down the seawall encouraging us and being as brave as any man could be. The others were the same, fighting like the devil. Our fellows crouched in firing positions at the seawall, smoking cigarettes or pipes and joking and making bets on who'd get it next. We naturally were stunned when we first got to the seawall but steadied up and were away to the races. Our men stood by the Bren guns, smoking and cursing the Germans with every curse they knew. We worked our way up and down the wall and wound up close by the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry on the western side of the beach. When we withdrew, we laid down smoke with a mortar and some canisters. This smoke clouded the promenade and we rushed for the boats. We ran a couple of hundred yards down the beach under heavy fire. 
Bullets tickled through my clothing, but never hit me. I was one of the last off the beach. I got behind the tank landing craft, grounded on the shore, and there were quite a few lads there. The landing craft was coming, and we waded out to our waist to get a boarder. Every Essex who was there and who got it went down fighting. There wasn't any guy who wasn't battling like mad. And those of us who came back want only to get back and knock the hell out of those Nazis for what they did to our boys. End quote. Stories of the POW experience came after their release. From legionmagazine.com, quote, The Germans transported the seriously wounded to local hospitals and the rest were boarded onto cattle cars for horrific trips to German prisoner of war camps in Molsdorf, Mulhausen, Eichstadt, Lambsdorf, Lam Lambinowicz, Poland. From the moment of capture, your first thought is to try to escape, Staff Sergeant R. E. Crum wrote in his diary. The thought possesses you every day and night. You examine every possibility. Prison camp life taught me how vital discipline was to survival. Even when the water froze in the huts in the winter, I would go out in the morning and wash my face in the snow, comb my hair, and straighten up my clothes. We had to stay above our circumstances. End quote. Winston Churchill publicly defended the raid. From winstonchurchill.hillside.edu quote, To the House of Commons on September 8th, he made the best of it. The raid must be considered as a reconnaissance in force. We had to get all the information necessary before launching operations on a much larger scale. I personally regarded the de assault to which I gave my sanction as an indispensable preliminary to full-scale operations. End quote. Privately, however, Churchill was concerned over the conduct of the operation. On the 21st of December, he wrote Chief of Staff Major General Ismay, quote, at first sight, it would appear to a layman very much out of accord with the accepted principles of war to attack the strongly fortified town front without first securing the cliffs on either side and to use our tanks in a frontal assault off the beaches, end quote. Patrick Porteous, mentioned above for earning a Victoria Cross for bravery at Dieppe, was quoted in his obituary in the Toronto Globe and Mail on the 16th of October 2000. He said, the people who planned it should have been shot. A 2008 report by Lieutenant Colonel Jim Goodman, Canadian Forces and Canadian Military Engineers concluded that, quote, Operation Jubilee did not fail because of poor intelligence, a lack of preparation, or the loss of operational surprise. It failed because a plan that originally started out as a joint battle of air, land, and sea forces had developed into an overly complex, scripted event that had no possible chance for success, end quote. Not many are left who were at Dieppe that day, but we should do our best never to forget. Were the losses at Dieppe worth the knowledge and experience gained that later led to Operation Overlord on June 6, 1944, and perhaps helped us to win the war in Europe? Some say yes, but many might argue that. Regardless, the soldiers who took part in that fateful raid on Dieppe, survivors and dead alike, made sacrifices that are still paying dividends to our free society today. Next, we'll hear from Matthew as he talks about his grandfather's experience at Dieppe and what he knows of it. So, so my grandfather, um, his name was Donald Stockton. He was in the Essex Scottish Regiment with uh, Private Eugene Cousineau mm -hmm. on that very day. So yeah. he, he was from Windsor, Ontario as well. Mm -hmm. Just let me go back a little bit. So imagine this, Mike. He... My grandfather set sail for England on 16th of August, 1940. So two years before yeah, so uh, Dieppe. He, he had never left Canada before. Wow. You know, he's a young, I don't know how old he was. I was I'm assuming he's 18 or 19. Sure, just right? a young guy, yeah. Um, never been anywhere before. And mm -hmm. his first trip is getting on a, on a ship and going to the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... The strange thing about this is they sat there in the UK doing training and stuff for two years. Yes. And Dieppe was the very first time most of them ever fought. Yes. Think about that. You know, here's my grandfather, young guy, no more than a kid. Yeah. Shipped off for the first time. The very first action he sees is this horrible battle. Yeah. Right, um, the, one of the worst days in Canadian military history, and it was a total massacre. Right, mm -hmm. so he was one of these soldiers storming the beach under yeah. heavy fire, and and he watched the vast majority of his friends killed beside him in a few hours. 
Yeah. Right. So his his regiment was actually completely decimated that day. Wow. And uh, it lost more soldiers than any other Canadian regiment during the war. Yep. Um, so he w- he was lucky he didn't die, but he was taken prisoner by the Nazis. So he was one of the POWs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So in the show notes, I've, I've supplied you with a photo of him, um, and I've given you a photo of him and his comrades being paraded in the streets by the Nazis with their hands in the air. So your grandfather's in that picture? Yeah. I can't figure out which one it okay. is, but, but that was his regiment. Right. And uh, he spent the the rest of the war in this uh, Nazi POW camp. Do you know which one he was in? No, it's, um, I have a, w- one of the postcards that he sent to my great uncle mm-hmm. from the camp. And I'm going to read it uh, and try not to tear up <laughs> as I'm reading this. Okay. Um, it reads, it's really funny because when you hear it, it reads rather mundane. Yeah. Right. But it's a letter to somebody from a POW. So, but what you have to understand is the mundane nature of it is that he was just trying to reassure my great uncle that everything's okay. So you have here that it says on the top, it says Kriegsgefangen in the Lager, okay. which, which is German for prisoner of war camp. Oh, wow. Right. So it's dated uh, September the 29th, 1944. So he's been a prisoner of war for two years at that point. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he spent the rest of the war after Dieppe in in this camp. Okay. Under the Nazis. So it reads, Dear Alan, who is my great uncle. Well, kid, how are you keeping? I hope you're all right, as I am the same. Are you still working in the factory or not? I wrote home three times before. Have you got any of them yet? I'll write you again as soon as possible. Don't worry. Donald Stockton. Oh, boy. And (laughs) it's it's that just little don't worry that gets me. That got me. Um, yeah, because what he's just, he's just trying to be like, Hey, I'm okay. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. Right. I think my uncle was working at, I think he was at the handle factory in Strathroy at the time. A handle factory. Yeah. We had a factory that made handles. For like sh- for ax handles? Shovels. And shovels. And shovels. Like okay. Yeah. There you go. So from wood. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so, you know, and the truth was Mike, it's, it's, um, from what I heard, he was, I didn't know him before the war, obviously. Yeah. But from what I heard, he was really never the same when he got back. Yeah. Um, he turned to the bottle. Mm-hmm. And I don't think my father had uh, the best father he could have had because of the war. Because of what your grandfather experienced. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know firsthand uh, the reality of generational trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, be, you know, the war doesn't end when the war ends. No. Like, um, the physical issues, the mental issues, the PTSD. PTSD wasn't even invented yet in terms of an understood thing. They called it shell shock at right. the time. And yeah. he had some heavy shit. Right. And that heavy shit was handed down from father to son and in some ways to grandson to, to me, you. Right? Yeah. And your brother. Yeah. And, um, you know, I never really had a relationship with him. We weren't close at all, uh, despite living in the same small town. I can really only remember, remember meeting him a few times. Wow. Um, because there was just a lot of, I think there was a lot of shit that happened. Yeah. Right. In the family. And, um, yeah, what's interesting is my great uncle from my mom's side of the family was actually in the battle as well. Mm-hmm. So he was in the Air Force. And when my mom and dad got married, my grandfather and great uncle met for the first time, started talking and realized that my grandfather was on the ground and he was in the air in, wow. in the same raid. Wow. Um, so the Battle of Dieppe is truly a part of my family's story. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I'm proud that my family helped fight the Nazis, help liberate Europe in the long run, and eventually help the, stop the slaughter of Jews. You know, I have a lot of Jewish friends whose family members were in concentration camps. Yep. And I have this weird, like, I have this weird connection to them because of my family's involvement in the war. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, but I find, you know, I'm proud this happened, but not that it happened that, my family is part of fighting it, but the battle makes me incredibly sad Yeah, because it, I believe it was a part of a, a lot of angu- anguish and pain for some of my family members for a long time. For sure. Yeah. I wouldn't exist had it not been for World War II, I don't think, mm. because my birth mom, mm. her mother was a Dutch war bride who was half Jewish and married a Canadian soldier, one of the ones who helped to liberate 
the Netherlands mm -hmm. and came over to Canada and gave birth to my mom. And here you are. And here I am. So. Yeah. So, you know, so this is difficult. It's, um, when I read the script, I was like, it hit me a lot harder than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. Um, just because, you know, a lot of this stuff lingered and it's part of the story. And hey, the show notes, I give you a photograph of my grandfather as well. Yeah, yeah. You can see where I get my handsome from. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll put all those on the on the website. But you can see my eyes and his eyes so similar. Yeah, you guys look a lot alike yeah. to tell you the truth. He was he was much better looking. He was anymore. good looking yeah, back he was, then, wasn't he? Was he was very pretty. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I I was born in 1969, and uh, that was you know 24 years after. World War II ended. Which and isn't fun. It, it is isn't a long, long it's time. It's a blink of an eye, though. It is, really. Yeah. Because I've been here in Vancouver for 29 years, and I look and I think, whoa, that's gone by pretty quick, so... You're, you've been here longer than between the war and when you were born. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it isn't an ancient thing. No. And, and things are happening in the world today, and that's why... I believe that Remembrance Day is an important thing for us to recognize here on Dark Poutine because it feels like the world is forgetting. It is, and it's also important, you know, stuff like this whole Kanye West thing right now. Ugh. Like, that stuff isn't funny to me at all. No. It's not funny. It's scary it's to me. It's stupid publicity, and I don't understand this guy. Mm. First of all, like, who does he think... What, he, what does he think he would have been done to by the Nazis back then? Yeah. He would have been dead in 2.5 seconds because he's black. And here he is being anti-Jew and pro-Nazis. And all this crap, all these people that are like holding up the Nazis or something. It's just like, you have no knowledge of history, period. <laughs> it's making me feel very, very sad. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so as... Uh, as is the slogan, lest we forget. Yes. You know. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 243, Remembrance Day 2022, Disaster at Dieppe. Now on to voicemails. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right, it is time for some voicemails. It looks like we have another four this week. Wow. I really appreciate it when people call in and uh, say, howdy do. So let's listen to our first one. This one's a bit long, and she says to bear with her, so. Hi, Mike and Matthew. Um, I don't make phone calls often, so I'm a little bit nervous. Bear, bear with me here. I'm a longtime listener, first time caller, um, and I'm from Vancouver Island. And uh, I won't give you my real name, so you can just call me Jay. Um, it's taken me about two years to finally catch up. I started after the pandemic. I needed something to do while I was stuck inside. So I thought, why not start listening to a podcast? Um, yeah, um, I just finished your episode about uh, internment in Canada. And I really wanted to say thank you for covering that. I feel it isn't discussed enough in history. And my great-grandparents and their children, including my grandfather, were put into Japanese internment camp during World War II in Vancouver. And it wasn't even something I was aware of until um, after my grandfather passed away. I remember learning, and I use that term loosely as I'm putting quotations around it, about Japanese internment camps uh, in my history, in my high school history class. But there was only like a very small paragraph about it. And all it said was like in our history books and all it said was Japanese Canadians were put into internment camps during World War II. Not a lot of information. Um, I've always been curious about that part of my family's history, but my uh, grandfather understandably never talked about it much. I didn't even know that my grandfather had a Japanese first name until his obituary, as he'd given himself an English name to help um, himself fit in more. I've always wanted to visit the Taj Mi Museum to learn more about um, Japanese internment in Canada and just see if there's anything about my family there as well. Um, anyways, thanks again. I love the show. 
and uh, I also know true crime is becoming sort of a controversial topic these days, which I understand why, of course. Um, but I just wanted to say that some of my favorite episodes of Dark Fifteen are the more uh, supernatural and historical ones, like uh, this one. Last thing, um, I know you like fun jobs, so I thought you might be delighted to know that I'm a sushi chef, actually. Um, still in training, so I'm quite new, but yeah, I'm very proud to be a sushi chef. Uh, anyways, thanks again, and uh, go shit in your hat. Well, you could hear a lot of emotion in her voice when she chatted with us. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when when Jay, I think we'll call mm-hmm. her, yeah. first of all, I love that you're a sushi, sushi, sushi chef. Sushi chef. Um, and yeah, as, someone with Japanese heritage. With a sushi chef. As a sushi chef. Um, as you know, Mike, sushi is my favorite thing Me too. in life. Yeah, I love sushi. Um, but as she's talking, it, it's, um, I started thinking of how, as Canadians, like mm-hmm. she said, you know, her, her grandfather didn't talk about it very much, but yeah. as Canadians, I don't know if this is universal, but it's true in my family, Yeah, is... All of these like dark parts of our family histories and secrets are like, it's like we put them in dark caves under the linoleum floor of the kitchen. You know what I mean? It, 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 we, we don't talk about stuff so often. Yeah. And we, a a lot of people want to, and this is why dark poutine exists. Yeah. Truthfully, this is why this show exists because I know there's an appetite for it, even though it's un-Canadian to talk about some of the things that. Uh, we've talked about, uh, and I say un-Canadian in quotes like she did. Yeah. Um, it is, there are important things that aren't spoken about or skirted around like, you know, one paragraph about Japanese internment in, uh, in your school textbook. I know that it is being talked about more now, but we need to talk about, there's a lot of things that Canada and Canadians sort of need to have a better look at. So, yeah, this is why we do the show. Yeah. Yeah, 100% why. And uh, she mentioned true crime being controversial. And some of it, uh, yes, the controversy for me is, uh, comes from the people who glorify uh, the killer and ignore the victim. Yeah. You know, um, there's a lot of uh, people kicking up uh, a stink about the recent Jeffrey Dahmer thing on Netflix. I watched it and I, I appreciated it, but you know, I can see what people mean that, you know, it sort of, it didn't really do a good job in a few ways. But anyway, that said, uh, I'm trying to, we, we are trying to make Dark Poutine an ethical true crime podcast, meaning we want to ensure that we are, we are saying things, we are dealing with these things in a way that helps, helps and educates rather than glorifies and uh, hurts and harms further harms people. I like that Jay likes the historical ones and supernatural ones as well. Well, if you want to listen to supernatural stuff, you can go to supernaturalcircumstances.com yeah, and subscribe true. to that uh, that other podcast that I do. I like some of the historical ones. I mean, today yeah, me we, too. Did, we did Dieppe, right? Mm-hmm. Which was difficult, but um, important. Yeah. But um, yeah, we should, yeah, we should do a few more. I agree. But thank you for calling in, Jade. And I, I'm, I'm so glad that somebody whose family um, was um, unfortunately interred in those camps uh, called in to yeah. give us a perspective. Yep. Let's listen to another one. Uh, here's a... <laughs> now you got me laughing. I just got to tell you guys that the internment camp one really touched me. I am from Fort Pierce, Florida. Little town in Florida. I'm married to a Canadian woman who is from Capascasing. When I heard that name, I was oh my God, you mentioned Capascasing. I actually have been there. I lived in Canada for 10 years. I loved it. Great. I lived in Erinsville, Ontario. But we went up to visit Capascasing, which is about a you know, year or two drive. And we went up there, and it was beautiful. I went to the museum. 
I didn't hear anything about the revolt, though, about the Ukrainians. She's Ukrainian. She was married to a Japanese man who was also his ancestors were in um, internment camp. They're in the capitation, and I was so glad to hear that you mentioned that. You guys are great. I listen to you every week. I love Canada. It's my second home. It could be my first home in a little bit, but right now, it's my second home. I love you guys. And I don't want you to take a shit in your hat. Take your hat and wash it, because it's probably really dirty. I will talk to you later. I will listen to you every week, and I love you guys. Bye. Aw, uh, thank you. We thank love you, you too. Thank you so much. That was really, really nice. And, uh, yeah, um, there is proof that people from Florida are not all completely out of their minds. No, she sounds like yeah, a, a, exactly. a, a, a very cool human being. I have been to Florida. My parents used to have a, a place that they stayed in Florida every every year. I, so. I used to own a place in Florida. There you go. Hey, and maybe we're going to go to CrimeCon. Yeah, if we're lucky and the pandemic stays away, where it is look, that? it's, it's going to be in Orlando this year. Where, that's where Disney World is, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Disney World. Okay. Uh, which... Is like two hundred dollars per person to go to. So guess where we're not going? Disney. World. I've never been to Disney. World. Oh damn it! I guess we're going to Disney World. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And here is another voicemail. This one's a little shorter, but yeah, let's have a listen. Hey guys, my name is Lindsay, and I live in Grand Prairie, Alberta. And I have an episode idea for you. In our area, there was a man. His name was Weebo Ludwig. And a lot of people know him for a mysterious, or not mysterious, but uh, he was never charged, uh, death on his farm. But he was actually also an eco-terrorist and has a very interesting story. And I haven't seen a single uh, podcast done on him. And I think it would be a really interesting subject uh, matter. So just an idea for you. And, uh, yeah, with that, I guess you can just go take a shit in your pants. <laughs> oh, my God, I said pants. I meant not. Kill me now. Kill me. <laughs> Kill me now. Uh, well, you know, every once in a while, you fart and it's something else. Lin so, yeah. Lindsay has a nice voice. She does. She had a very so sort of smoky voice. From Grand Prairie. Grand Prairie, Alberta. And Weebo Ludwig, I am a, uh, well aware of. And uh, just making a note to myself, uh, again, to push, maybe push that up because it is a really interesting episode uh, idea. Weebo Ludwig. Yeah, he is a, a that's he an was. Interesting name. He's passed away. He was an interesting character. So okay, perhaps that will come sooner than you think. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. And we have one final voicemail oh, this week. Yeah. Here we go. Hi. I just got a chance to listen to the history of wartime internment in Canada. Um, my name is Kale. I've called in a few times. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, my fiance is Ukrainian. And um, with all of this going on, like this is, this it was really eye-opening for me because I knew of the Japanese citizen internment camps in World War II, but I had no idea of what was going on during World War I. So I really appreciate you folks um, talking about this. And I hope you have a good week. Go shit in your hat. Bye. Cool. Thanks, Cal. Yeah, yeah, they're, uh, they've are they called him before, so yeah, very nice. I want to know, so fiancé, so when's the wedding? Yeah, exactly. Okay, we want to know when the wedding is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Please. Yeah, w invite us maybe. <laughs> if I'd, if I'd you live here in Vancouver. I'd love to go to a Ukrainian wedding. Me too. Well, I, I just like to go to weddings because I get fed. <laughs> <laughs> I get fed and I don't have to feed myself for the night. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, yeah. Thank look, you, Kel. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right. There is no Patreons this week, but we made that 
quite clear because we are recording two episodes in one day. So, but if you want to, it's a real good idea to go to dark, uh, patreon.com slash dark poutine and sign up to be a patron. And I'll give you the job that you've always wanted. Yeah. You'll get, you will get, you'll get to hear your name said on the show and you get a job and all that kind of stuff and you get to support this show and ensure that there's probably going to be more episodes because this is how we get paid. Episodes is good. Episodes is good. Anyway. No episodes is bad. No episodes is bad. So, uh, yeah. Thank you folks to the, thank you to the folks who are patrons and thank you to the future folks who will become patrons. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this week's episode. Uh, it was a tough one, but we got through it. And thank you very much to everyone who has ever done anything in service of our freedom in this country. And those currently doing so. Exactly. Uh, And those who are planning on doing so. Thank you for that. Anyway, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Not a bad yablico. Okay, bye people. (laughs) 